I'm Alan Marks, a partner at Millbank in our Global Project Energy and Infrastructure Group. Uh, we are finishing up today with a fascinating panel uh, of experts from around the country, from Indianapolis, uh, Miami, San Jose, and Austin, and looking at issues of climate change and the impact that that has on airports and aviation and ways that airports are becoming more resilient and more sustainable. So I'm going to let each of our uh, uh, guests introduce themselves, and then we'll jump right into it. Carrie, why don't we start with you? Hey, and I'm Carrie. I'm Carrie Ramanam, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer with the City of San Jose. Um, as a city department, the airport is a city department, much like our regional wastewater facility. So we're pretty integrated. Good. Thanks very much, uh, Lindsay. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, Lindsay Mockamer. I'm a project manager with Austin Energy Green Building. Um, and while I work for um, the uh, utility company, I've been brought on specifically to work with um, Austin Bergstrom International Airport on advancing their green building goals through planning, design, and operation. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Patricia? Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Patricia Gomez. I work for Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience. Uh, as part of the county operations, we operate uh, Miami International Airport and a few other uh, smaller executive airports. Um, our focus of the Office of Resilience is countywide, so we collaborate with all the major departments, including the uh, Miami-Dade County Airport. And um, we have um, the mitigation side of the house, as well as the adaptation to sea level rise, which is uh, uh, a prime uh, issue for us here in South Florida. Good. Thank you, Patricia. And Todd. I'm Todd Kavner, uh, Indianapolis Airport Authority, Director of Environment Sustainability. Uh, we uh, operate the Indianapolis International Airport and five reliever airports. Good. Thank you, Todd. So, so Carrie, let me start with you. Um, and I want to kind of put it in context because airports remain and transportation generally generally remains a major source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in cities before we look at resilience and sustainability and impacts are there things that airports are doing either you know on the air side the land side at the airport or with respect to connectivity to the transportation network generally that are hopefully going to mitigate some of the uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions and other things to contribute to climate change how are you doing that in san jose uh, well, thanks for asking. So, um, in San Jose, we, uh, the transportation emissions account for 51% of our greenhouse gas emissions. The airport contributes 5% of those. So, um, so it is a, um, a good lever to move on, but it's certainly um, getting people out of their cars and then um, transitioning into a renewable energy source is, uh, is more important. Um, but the way we look at the airport's um, contribution is it also helps with behavior change. So, you know, a lot of people are going through that airport. And so we're looking at it as an education portal and a leading by example portal, but um, it's not going to meet our Paris Climate Accord uh, goals just by focusing on airport transportation. Okay. And, and Todd, I know in Indianapolis, um, you, you're doing some innovative things on the construction side too. I know we talked before uh, privately about uh, some of the things you're doing with runways and taxiways that have longer term potential impacts. Could you share a bit about that? Yeah, um, we obviously um, are currently designing a runway five right reconstruction project um, for the airport, but for the region. And given the amount of concrete that um, is needed for this uh, important project, the potential greenhouse and gas emissions are significant. Uh, to reduce this uh, impact, we will be using a technology um, that injects captured carbon into the concrete production process. Um, this reduces the amount of cement that is needed. Uh, this will greatly reduce the amount of carbon um, that is produced by the project, but also by storing the, con the carbon in the pavement during the process, it would, uh, that carbon that other eyes would have uh, entered the atmosphere. So uh, we're getting uh, both material, um, less material needed for the project, but we're also uh, capturing carbon that would be impacting the region and, and storing it in the pavement. Good. 
So, Carrie, uh, maybe if I can ask you to you know, put your engineer's hat on for a second and uh, look at how this is um, interfacing with other aspects of operations. Um, do you consider, and I'm going to come back also to Lindsay and Patricia in a second, kind of the same question, uh, but do you consider this to be, uh, climate change is a source of of risk and we need to focus at the airport on hardening and resilience or is it the fact that sustainability is kind of an opportunity for the airport to contribute to broader urban goals that will hopefully ameliorate climate change? So thank you. It's actually both. I mean, you know, we um, to meet our transportation goals, we have to have a functional airport. We have to get people to uh, use the airport that's closest to them and reduce vehicle miles traveled in that regard. Um, but we have to mitigate the sea level rise as we're right on the bay and we have to mitigate that for the community. So much like the regional wastewater facilities in the region, um, you know, we're looking at protecting all of the community. And so those mitigation efforts still have to move concurrently, but then um, then looking at, you know, are we making the best choices for how we rebuild the airport? So, you know, using the right types of concrete as, as uh, the other gentleman noted, and then making sure that we're helping folks to um, upgrade their homes, et cetera. So it's really the airport is one part of a broader movement um, of the whole Bay Area. And I think that's probably true in every jurisdiction. Yeah, so a lot of people get on the plane in San Jose and fly to Austin. Uh, to tech hubs, so we'll do the same thing. Uh, Lindsay, if I could ask you, when you look at this, is it uh, sustainability and resilience as more of a risk or more of an opportunity? Where's the emphasis? Um, so I'll echo definitely both. <laughs> um, so uh, I yeah, I want to talk about how Austin Bergstrom is considering both resilience and green building and sustainability which in my view are very inextricably linked, but there's a couple of different lenses that we're applying to considering resilience and green building and sustainability. So um, resilience first, um, AUS has developed 10 strategic goals in the past year um, that are gonna be execu executed over the next two to three years. And one of those 10 is um, planning for resilience in airport operations. Um, so this is optimizing to enhance resilience from future disruption, including operational resilience, environmental, and in the face of disasters. Um, so this is significant, the fact that it's coming at a strategic planning level, because this is something that's coming from the top down. Um, and it's this type of strategic um, thinking and action plan creation that's going to be kind of a push for culture change um, in the way that operational teams, safety teams, emergency management teams plan, but also it's gonna trickle into infrastructure planning um, and not just operational planning. So um, on the infrastructure side of things, right, it's gonna prompt us and, and by us, I guess I mean um, design professionals and um, the delivery managers um, at the airport to think about what are the asset, assets that we have um, in terms of our water systems, our wastewater systems, our transportation infrastructure, and how is it vulnerable to stresses and uh, shocks? Um, and what do we need to do to maintain, upgrade, and change our infrastructure to mitigate for that type of disaster? Um, so already on front of mind um, in types in that type of planning is thinking about potable water backup. So um, one of the things prompting that was the recent February uh, winter storm URI um, that dramatically impacted Austin. And um, one of the effects of um, the water system in the city was that we had boil water notices for a number of days and um, ultimately had to partner with a local brewery to get potable water chucked in so concessionaires could continue to operate. So it's kind of prompting us to think about, oh, that's a vulnerability we have and, and what do we need to be doing um, to plan for our infrastructure um, to uh, mitigate that um, operational impact. Um, on the flip side of things, I do want to mention green building too, right? Because it's inextric inextricably connected um, in a way of mitigating climate change. Um, and the way that we've approached um, sustainability and green building at the airport is less been top down and it's been like middle up um, and it's been evolving um, over the course of the 21 year history and um, really integrated into our standard practice now. So we have a, a number of LEED certified and Austin Energy Green certified buildings, including the terminal expansion has gold certification for LEED and 
um, I won't go too dark, far down the rabbit hole of, of the way we're <laughs> um, executing green building at the airport. I probably could talk for an hour about it. Um, but, you know, also the idea of measuring our carbon impacts through the ACA, the airport carbon accreditation program, we're at level 2 targeting being at level 3 um, with ultimately reducing our carbon footprint um, this year. Um, so that is to say that. We're coming up on um, an expansion program at the airport. So while a lot of um, sustainability practices and green building practice has evolved over time, they've become standard practice and we're going to be able to take those best practices into our expansion, but also the strategic focus that's coming from the top down about resilience and what do we need to consider in terms of vulnerabilities is also going to be built into the decision making process of the expansion program. So. There's opportunities that have come and there's some strategy that's coming, but it's going to inform the way that the airport gets developed. Good. Lindsay, thank you. That's that's very helpful. Uh, Patricia, we, let's go to Miami for a second. Uh, and I want to pick up on a couple of the themes that Lindsay just mentioned, because one of the things that comes to mind is the ways that in, airports are impacted by climate vary. They vary by sector. They vary by location. They vary by the type of airport that you have. I mean, even we just look at, for example, um, it's not climate, but look at the pandemic. Uh, and how uh, disparate the impacts have been on U.S. aviation. Airports in markets like Miami that depend quite a bit on international travel and also on business travel have been, of course, much more hard hit uh, from that. When you look at climate risks as they impact airport operation, where is the stress? Is it the economic impact in the region, including, of course, Caribbean and Latin America, not just the Southeast U.S.? Is it physical harm to the airport itself because of, say, severe storms, hurricanes, extreme weather events, or is it interoperability with other main utility systems and networks like transportation and water and power? Where where do you see that shaking out over the next 10 or 20 years in your long range planning? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. I, I think it's a combination of all those factors you mentioned. Um, Miami International Airport, it's almost 10 million square foot uh, under one roof. We have, uh, uh, it's our economic engine, one of our most precious and economic engines. And we are here in ground zero. So we have both hurricanes, a storm surge, and chronic flooding due to sea level rise. So our infrastructure in the floor, um, it's, it's, um, it's impacted by that. So I think that the strategic plan is um, we are looking at all uh, the options and, and how we can keep the airport operating um, in, in an environmentally friendly manner, uh, but um, keep producing the top dollars that we need to feed into the economy of the county and, and continue providing that, um, that um, connection to other places in South America, the Caribbean and more. Uh, Miami-Dade County completed an assessment of vulnerability of county-owned critical facilities, including the airport. And um, as you said, um, it's very unique um, to each air geographical area. Miami International Airport sits in a side of reclaimed wetlands, which is typical for, for many um, airports, and it's just a few feet above the groundwater table. So we work with colleagues uh, from the aviation department to rank based on their criticality, criticality um, basically how essential are, are, are these uh, facilities that are in the compound of the airport or in, in, in this um, large setting to get the airport back online after an event. It doesn't matter what the event is. So we use a GIS, GIS and Excel based um, ranking method and we were able to hone in where the greatest risk are. Um, in the case of uh, in Miami International Airport, we found that the fuel farm is one of the most critical assets. Uh, and uh, in older sections as one of the most flood uh, prone. So we are raising our assets in the fuel farm and elsewhere in the airport. And um, when we are redeveloping, uh, we are trying to lessen the, the flood risk and do uh, hardening and all this. Um, but we are also taking opportunity on all the mitigation strategies. And um, I wanted to mention that we have done uh, a lot of work to make the um, operations of the airport as, as efficient as possible. Uh, we have a change 
changed um, more than 100,000 lights of, um, of uh, light bulbs um, to LEDs and we, uh, we have um, saved water. And uh, we are doing a pilot with the, uh, our local utility, Florida Power and Light, and we have a, now a floating solar system that you can see when you land at MIA. So, um, again, it's a it's a very complex operation. It serves um, many. Um, uh, um, it, it has a very important for many aspects. So um, we have to consider all of them. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, you know, I, I'm mindful that all of you are working in this environment where you have lots of different people you're accountable to, right? There's elected officials. There's agencies. There's different agencies. There's the FAA uh, at the federal level. Um, Todd. How how much collaboration is there, uh, or what would you change to improve it among the different agencies and within your own, you know, metropolitan government around airport sustainability issues? Well, I, I think uh, collaboration is very. Um, it's as as people in my organization have have heard me discuss it. Um, I try to take the approach of allowing everybody to. Um, have the opportunity to identify opportunities um, and then just have a discussion around. And that starts to get in both from, you know, your staff level for as you think outside of our little bubble at the airport, um, you have to work closely with the, the city government. We're an airport authority standalone, but we, we align pretty close with, with the city and um, we do uh, work closely together. Um, as they're developing and working through their uh, thrive program, their sustainability program, um, you know, we're, we're pay very much paying attention. Um, we're paying attention and work very closely with FAA um, back to the runway discussion. We've been working with them on the mod, the standards for that carbon capture um, just to, to get that worked in. Um, we're going to be continuing to work with 1 of our major cargo operators at Indy um, to try to get the. Um, edge lights switched over to LEDs um, with with some impacts to their heads up display. So you know there's a lot of lot of stakeholders that you you definitely have to um, work with, um, pay attention to. Can't can't just take something and, and say here you're going to go do this and and not understand the operation or the economic impact because that that actually is worse to accomplishing the overall goal. Um, by not paying attention and working with your stakeholders. Yeah, thank you, Todd. And, and Carrie, too, when you look at the Bay Area, you know, obviously there's major airports around you, not just in San Jose, but in San Francisco with SFO, uh, in Oakland, uh, and smaller, you know, uh, regional airports uh, besides the big three. There's always been talk in the past of more collaboration on both air travel and I would say transportation generally uh, within the Bay Area, but a lot of times that's sort of um, skittered up against the competition that we see among the different uh, parts of the region. Will sustainability give more impetus to more collaboration in the, on a regional basis in in the Bay Area? I think we all aspire to work together more closely, and it's something I think every one of us can say, oh, I wish I could do more, um, and certainly pulled in a lot of directions. Um, you know, we we collaborate with other agencies and, and certainly with other airports. Um, a year or two ago, we converted all of our buses to 100% electric, and 50% of that was was grant funded. So, um, you know, we we like that those kinds of participations. I guess we'd like more collaboration with partners that bring money. Uh, and so, so you know, the airports are each unique, much like the cities are. So we there's kind of big things that we can um, we can standardize and learn from each other, and our staff do that on an ongoing basis. But I think the key to sustainability in the long term is for each entity to do what works for that entity, for the people and the ratepayers and the um, and the community that are going to to use and benefit and and uh, and pay for it. So um, so the big things we partner with um, a lot of the uh, um, customized things will each uh, will each tailor to our own needs. Um, but yeah, I don't think we can make the big changes unless we work on those together. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Lindsay, you know, one of the other places where there's collaboration is with the private sector, because you're in the middle of procurements kind of constantly uh, for upgrades, sometimes, you know, major things, maybe even P3 models, other times more traditional procurement. 
uh, for sustainability metrics in particular, how do you get those KPIs through? Do you, does the, does Austin desire to maybe encourage private sector innovation by saying, here are the results we want, you figure it out. Or is it more prescriptive? Is it more, you know, um, where you've already done preliminary engineering, already have an idea of exactly what it is you want, and you want to have a tighter band on your bid so you can actually compare apples to apples, and that may drive a different risk allocation? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really interesting question, um, and I think it's something that is going to be answered over the next few months to a year. Um, I think one of the things that I'm doing in my role um, in helping the airport uh, work towards their green building goals is to align what are those green building goals. So, as I mentioned, kind of a lot of the sustainability and green building initiatives have kind of been opportunistic and kind of from the middle up. So, um, with the idea of collaboration, right, as airlines ask for electrification initiatives of their ground service equipment, um, you know, how can we help them? apply for grants to get that equipment and can we put in charging infrastructure? And so there's a lot of things that we've learned how to do that have been built into our projects that result in green building projects. Um, and I think one of the things that we'll be doing um, moving into um, new capital improvement programs um, is to come up with what are those metrics. So we've got um, working on an owner's project requirement document that kind of lays those out and um, for just each individual project as, as it goes on and having those conversations early on so that we're leading into a project with an understanding that everybody can be working towards. Um, I think one of the things that the airport has committed to um, is naturally all the new construction needs to meet lead um, or uh, lead silver, um, but there's a, an evolution of the green building policy that's kind of in place and, and Austin Bergstrom is piloting this newer version where they're trying um, Austin Energy Green Building, which is where I come in, um, which is the local rating standard. And so using that um, rating metric um, at a three star level for all projects going forward. So um, I guess all that is to say, you know, we've got a pretty aggressive city standard when it comes to sustainability and, and the um, net zero goals and green building goals and the airport is part of that like everyone else has been talking about um, and it, i think part of my role is to work with project teams both on the owner side and the designer side up front to get those goals clearly defined in the projects as they as they move forward thanks so patricia Lindsay mentioned airlines uh, in passing and i want to stay with that for a second because usually there's this idea that well, the airport, the airport authority, the municipality, you know, your your job dealing with also with the FAA, of course, are your facilities. You know, you've got to get passengers through, you've got to get cargo through, you've got to maintain, you know, security and reliability and 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 so forth. And the airlines, you know, they've they've obviously got concerns on the land side with ticketing and security and lounges and uh, fuel service and catering and everything else for their planes. But the planes themselves are their responsibility. But there are precedents, for example, you know, noise ordinances, you know, going back decades where the airlines and the planes that they're choosing to fly have to meet local rules uh, as far as their impacts. Are there possibilities that the airlines would become then partners with the airports in other types of innovations like renewable jet fuel or other things that, you know, create more efficiencies and less environmental impact? Uh, for their planes, not just electrification at the gates, but actually in, in the overall operations and how they interface with the airports. And that could come down to scheduling, congestion relief, and, and other things. Well, definitely, we have been working on this topic since um, 2010, when we started uh, our ISO 14001 certification that involved um, many of the things that you mentioned, um, all the um, maintenance hangars in the airport that are usually leased to different airlines. And uh, we have been working with them, um, like everybody says, to um, change the ground support equipment, um, to um, a different um, type of project. So we have been working with them hand in hand and uh, we have been um, uh, having a very willing partner. Um, we have um, many, many major airlines and, and our real estate, um, the, the airport's real estate um, staff work with them um, day to day um, in. Um, so it's a, a very, very important component of, of, of what we do. Um, like um, 
it was mentioned before, uh, we also have a sustainability, sustainable buildings programs that require all major improvements and new construction to be LEED certified or equivalent. Uh, we are now um, testing Envision uh, for infrastructure projects, so all the runways and the more infrastructure type of uh, projects, we are doing that. And, and it, it has to be uh, supported uh, uh, by the airlines. So Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do it, right? Um, there are our one of our major customers, and and we have to cater to them as well as to the public. So I think it's it's uh, inevitable that we have to work together to to re reduce um, all the. Um, all the other issues that we have, even when we talk about losing the network connection for a couple of seconds, that caused a lot of problems everywhere. So uh, it goes to thinking about how we can improve that and how we can provide a better service to our tenants. So um, yes, <laughs> to all all the above. <laughs> I, mean, I want to stay with you for a second too, if I may, Patricia, and also look at this distinction between goods movement or cargo, air cargo in this case, and people. Because those trends are not actually going in the same, they're not as, they're not as in sync maybe as they have been uh, in the past. Both obviously currently with the pandemic, that's different, but also you know looking forward, how does that impact sustainability and, and planning overall? Well, um, you bring a very good important point. Um, Miami is hot and humid, right? So most of our cargo uh, or, or a lot of our cargo requires refrigeration. And so we have large facilities that provide refrigeration to uh, flowers, to food, and, and to many of those things. So we have seen a huge development of that type of facilities around the airport, supported by the airport. So again, to your point, it's not only the actual operation of the airport, it's all those ancillary facilities that support the uh, cargo and passenger and whatever you think that is coming through the airport. So. Um, in the county, we have worked with them. Uh, we have a, um, an economic development arm and, and also uh, the Beacon Council, um, and they are working together with the, with the industry. Um, here in Miami-Dade County, we had a, a very important plan that is called One Community, One Gold, and the industry of aviation was one of the main um, topics of, of, of that and, and how we are a hub for aviation for be, because um, here through Miami, there is not only the amount of passengers that come through, but the tons of cargo that comes through and what are the services required to support those operations. So um, definitely a very, very important uh, piece of the pie. And, and we are working um, to make sure that uh, we consider sustainability, resiliency, energy conservation, all the good things, not only inside the airport, but outside on those ancillary facilities. Good. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, Carrie, uh, let's look to at emissions generally, not just greenhouse gas emissions, but also, uh, you know, uh, regular air emissions, which where, you know, uh, you've, you've got this, the stationary source for power, but you've also got mobile source emitters coming, you know, people coming to and from airports and the planes coming to and from airports. And congestion, as people have pointed out, is the sign of a healthy economy. I mean, you show me a city without traffic and I'll show you a city that's got some severe economic growth challenges. But that congestion, whether it's people waiting to pick up passengers, trucks waiting to get onto the, you know, into the freight terminals, or especially planes waiting for a gate, waiting to taxi, waiting for takeoff in the very limited slots or runway space that may be available, uh, generate significant proportions of the total emissions that come out of, you know, airport operations. Are there things that could be done to lessen congestion and make, uh, usage of these facilities more efficient without depending on a pandemic or a slam on demand to, you know, to achieve that, that goal. Well, well, thank you. And I, you know, my hope is a couple of years from now, um, it won't, the, we'll, we'll believe that a, a city and an airport with no congestion can actually be a viable economic power. Um, I think we do need to figure out congestion, you know, more broadly than certainly an airport. 
Um, but I think, you know, an airport is like a big employer in our in our city and in, in most cities. And so it's it's looking at how are we getting traffic in and out and is there a better way? And and certainly, um, you know, we've all figured out how to get Uber and Lyft in and out more more quickly. But I don't know that we figured out how to um, incent and motivate people to um, to do other actions such as taking the bus. Um, BART will be in uh, rapid transit will be in San Jose soon. And so looking to um, much like we do on our freeways, looking to get people out of single occupancy vehicles and then for our for our service providers, looking to move them away from um, gas and diesel powered vehicles. And that's going to be much easier than getting the passengers transitioned. And so we think we can move the, um, the delivery vehicles much more quickly. They're also much more routine. So it's a little easier um, to move those than to, to get the passengers. But we'll figure out ways like we've incented people to park EVs um, and, uh, and transition their vehicles. We just need to figure out if it's worth the incentive dollars or not. So our Climate Smart San Jose plan is very much based on return on investment. So we looked at the cost of each of our actions and we looked at how our community would feel about it and kind of said, let's do the things that, that are uh, most cost effective first, and then we'll work our way uh, sort of down the list because cost is has to be a factor. And we have to run a profitable airport. We have to um, do the things that make financial sense. And I think that's why we look at it as, as a business, as I know you all do. I can hear from the, uh, the tone of the conversation. So it's you know more than just timing signal lights, but, um, but looking at are there peak times where we could move traffic differently um, in our city. And uh, we've done a bit of it, but I think we have a lot more to do and, uh, and a lot more studying to evaluate those passenger behaviors, certainly uh, things have changed a lot in the last year, um, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of people biking to the airport. I don't think that's reasonable, but uh, but I think we can get a lot more people traveling differently. But yeah, we haven't had the answer, but uh, if anybody does, we'd love to love to partner with you on figuring it out. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's interesting to look at the, the what airport traffic during the pandemic has done in this one sense. Uh, you know, where there maybe used to be 10 flights a day on a particular route, let's say that's now five or six, whatever that might be, but they all happen at the same time because the whole point of a hub and spoke network is that people have to move from one plane to another. They're, you know, some of them may be getting on or off as the you know, start or end of their journey in your airport, but others may be, you know, connecting through. And that's much more efficient if all the planes are all trying to get to the limited gates at exactly the same moment. So it's, you may come to airports today, find them even more crowded than they, you feel like they were more than a year ago. But if you stuck around for an hour and a half, there'd be no one there before the next onslaught of connecting flights comes in. Um, let's come back to fuels for a second and innovation, both for, we've, we've talked, we've heard about, uh, uh, I'm going to connect some of your dots. We've talked about EV charging and electric vehicles. We've talked about electric buses servicing airports. Uh, we've talked about, or I, I mentioned uh, renewable jet fuel for aircraft. Uh, Todd, you know, there's a history over at the Brickyard of innovation on fuels for motorsport in Indianapolis. Um, at your airport at Indy, are there things either on the land side or the air side where we can expect more energy efficiency from, you know, on the transportation uh, as opposed to just the facilities themselves? Yeah, um, and uh, it's for air shuttle. Uh, I mean, we are, we are continuing. Todd, let me make a, if I can't, if you can hear me, let me make a suggestion. Our in our Todd? For Todd, I think we're missing your signal. If you could maybe turn off your camera for a moment, we can then at least hear what you have to say. And I think that will contribute to the yes. conversation. Okay, if you if you just, if you turn off your camera and then speak, I think we'll be able to hear you better because I think the bandwidth is limited. Yep. It's breaking up. Hear me now. The camera is. Okay, can you try hear again. Now? Yes, that's much better without the camera. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we, we can hear you. We can hear you. Sure, but uh, 
you know, I'll skip, you know, um, obviously we have electric, I don't know, plus we have, you know, electric, but we are looking at other technologies um, um, and not necessarily but as a um, uh, energy source um, and looking at it from a resiliency standpoint. I think there's a lot we've got to work through um, on that. We do that and that and, and see that it is an opportunity. And, uh, we are very evaluating that. Is Okay, thank you, thank you, Todd. Um, Patricia, I want to. Patricia, I want to come back over to you if I could, and I want to look at energy in context, because sometimes it gets maybe too much attention. Uh, it's partly because it's something that's easy to measure, right? You can measure your energy consumption pretty simply. You can measure energy efficiency. You can and, and look at how usage patterns impacts uh, a lot of that uh, for time of day and seasonality, and you know it's easy to focus for metrics on things that are easy to measure. But there's a lot of the things that you mentioned before that are climate risks that are kind of harder to measure. They tend to be high magnitude events that are becoming increasingly probable, but they're spaced and they're hard to predict. How do you analyze that um, intellectually and filter into planning in order to build a consensus that gets support for investments that might not be as obviously um, uh, the, minute, the payback may be harder to quantify, but you know from other other mechanisms that they actually are at least as important, if not more so. That's a very good question, Alan. Um, so, I think the 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 main point is that uh, our airport and our facilities are here to stay for a long time. So our planning horizon is long. We have a facility that probably will be 40, 50 years old. So uh, when we talk about climate change and sea level rise, that's when that intersect. Um, we are lucky that uh, we have a very strong collaboration in the region. We have the regional uh, compact on climate change in, the, in South Florida that is comprised of four counties, which is Monroe, south of Miami-Dade, Miami-Dade County, Broward County, and West Palm Beach County. So we are the four most populous counties in, 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 south, in, in Florida, and we are working together. So um, the compact comes with a, a, um, a projection uh, that it's adopted by all the four compact partners uh, about sea level rise so that we have a horizon. We are having a planning uh, horizon um, that we can say we are planning to have this much of, of, of um, sea level rise in the next 50 years, and that's what we are planning to. So that's our main planning tool. We have that um, horizon, that planning uh, forecast. Um, here in, in Florida, which I, I'm not sure if it happens uh, other places, but we see sunny, sunny day flood. Uh, events that are happening very frequently. Um, and so we are monitoring those events on a, a yearly basis. And uh, we know when they are happening, we can measure the losses, uh, people and residents that have been having um, flooding on a frequent basis and losses every uh, so often. So we know it's just about time that what we can see in the community is going to come to the county assets. Um, so it's very clear. I know it's a long horizon, but we also um, have talking about the cost of inaction. Correct. So uh, we can say um, hardening our infrastructure today is going to be a lot cheaper than having to deal with sea level rise and, and flooding on a monthly basis and the losses that and the interruption of services that cause in an every day. So um, I guess to sum it up, uh, we are lucky that we have the planning tool about the projections. We have been talking big about what is the cost of inaction and what are the safe if we act now as as opposed to waiting for 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 later in infrastructure systems that have a, a long life yeah it's a really good point um which uh, makes me want to come uh, back over to Carrie to ask uh kind of related to that when you have this this distinction between short-term and long-term 
and you're doing a very long term infrastructure planning, the 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 people who are being protected or who will benefit from that may not be the people using the facilities today. And we've seen it in California with wildfires and who should bear the cost of remediation or recovery. We see it in other areas as well, kind of surrounding uh, this in Texas. They're currently grappling you know, with the fallout from uh, the, the winter events and what that means for the power grid and who should bear the costs of dealing with this. So, Carrie, when you look at infrastructure planning in San Jose, who should bear the cost of some significant near term investments that prevent bigger expenses down the road? Uh, whether that's resilience or sustainability or something else. I think Austin and Miami should should bear the cost of that. That'd be great. Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, it's um, part of being a community is ensuring that your infrastructure is maintained and, and established. And, you know, much like a school, you know, you're we all need to we all need to support what the community needs. And I just don't think we can look at um, climate, uh, the climate needs so narrowly. Um, but what's harder, as as we all know, is to get folks' attention on these long-term initiatives. Like if we don't take action now, then it continues um, to get hotter. Some, you know, they're sort of how do you how do you do the mitigation and and uh, risk prevention acts that we need to do now, and then also have money to sort of stop change from uh, con uh, continuing at the pace it is now. And, and so I think we all grapple with with doing both and then also our normal job, which is getting people in and out of an airport and onto planes and, and onto their destination satisfactorily. And so as, as some of the other folks have mentioned, it's really about planning and about locking in the actions that we're going to take into our master planning efforts so that we're making inc incremental progress on that long-term initiative and adjusting where we have more success, maybe putting a little more effort into that. But, um, but you know, from, it sounds like what the other cities are doing are pretty similar to what we're doing, we're working with the city, working um, to learn from, you know, our clean energy initiatives to, to water saving initiatives and then making sure the airport is um, embracing those as well. And so um, so I think you have to unfortunately do all of it and um, and you have to do all of it really well to make a difference. Um, and then it just has to be um, a, a continued sort of momentum. And um, and I think I'm, I'm excited that everyone's moving in that direction um, from, from the other airports as well. Um, but I, I think we all need to step it up Quite a bit, quite a bit more to make a real difference, and 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 we're all struggling with that. And from my personal perspective, we're going to need to get external investment to make that happen. Um, to really do the change we need to do, um, it, the, each airport can't do it on their own. It's just too much. Um, and so I think each city is in that same that same boat. But the real big change tends to happen with uh, federal and state dollars as well. Good. Thank you. Lindsay, um, I've been throwing around terms because working in the industry, we use them kind of all the time, but they don't have the same meaning. So I wonder if we, you could help me just untangle for anybody who's not clear. Resilience, sustainability, and efficiency are not the same thing. Those are actually three different things that may overlap and may go together. And which one we talk about, whether say just resilience and sustainability, just to stay with those, may make a difference as far as the type of investment we're looking at, who should pay for it, this question we looked at before, how you get political or, you know, support for it or attract investors. So what for you and your planning and getting consensus or you know, other stakeholders at the table, what's the difference between sustainability and resilience and why does it matter? You know, that's kind of interesting, Alan. I think regardless of what question you were going to ask me, I was going to start by making a note about how it's always really interesting when we talk about climate change and the topic of resilience, how quickly it overlaps um, with sustainability. Um, because I think when I think of resilience, um, there's um, adaptation and mitigation, right? So the mitigation component of doing everything we can um, from a precursor, like what can we do to prevent climate change and prevent the worsening of severe storm events? And um, that leads to um, reducing our energy uses, reducing our water usage and the impact on the environment in general, right? And then there's the resilient, the adaptation component, which is how can we assess where we stand um, because climate change impacts are real and um, uh, severe storm events are worsening. 
um, and we have to deal with this. So how do we adapt by creating resilient infrastructure that it can bounce back after a disaster happens with minimal interruption to operation? Um, so I think of sustainability on kind of the preventative side, though it does definitely overlap with the adaptation side. And it's just, um, you know, we're talking internally about it more and more as just kind of a duh. Of course, resilience and, and adaptation is a part of um, green building and what we're doing. Um, to reduce the impact on the environment on the upfront side. Um, so, yeah, can, <laughs> is there more of that answer that I should give or, or is that that makes sense? But it, I, no, I appreciate question. that because it's a hard topic okay. to, to truncate like that. It's, yeah. it's important. Uh, I, I guess I'd ask a final question for each of you, maybe a very short answer. And we'll start with you, Patricia, um, as to if, if you look at that distinction between sustainability and resilience. You could almost make the argument that if you don't do enough now that's sustainable, uh, we have free rider problems. So let's say if we don't all collectively do enough that's sustainable, then we're all going to need to become a whole lot more resilient quicker than we thought. Maybe we could let's just say that, assume that that's true. Um, do you? And I'm going to also assume from what I've heard from all of you that we're going in the right direction. The question then is, are we going fast enough with respect to investments? Uh, that address potential or actual climate change impacts on airports. Patricia, just a few words from each of you. Are we going fast enough or should we do more? Um, I think we should do more. Um, and I think the, the first task when we talk about climate change and, and to go along with the, the other panelists is um, you have the, the source of the sickness and then you have uh, the medicine that is help you get by. So we are investing in both front ends, but uh, we need to invest more on the source of sickness. And we need to start with um, having a common accounting framework. Um, many people don't have or don't use that common accounting framework. And so the emissions generated at the airports are usually um, split or, or divided. And, and even some cities and some governments don't even account them because it's not happening in their backyard. So uh, we need to do more. We need to have a better accounting system so that we can all have the players contributing to the one solution. Good. Thank you. Uh, we had just a couple of minutes, Lindsay. Yeah, um, I think we can always do more. Um, I think I happen to be on the cusp of this um, new capital expansion program at the airport. So the the levers that we have to make a real difference with the investment we're making on some infrastructure, you know, starting with the planning. Um, is going to be big. So that opportunity to really make a big difference and move the needle in embodied carbon, operational carbon, um, planning for resilience and disasters is, is, I think, a big win in having the opportunity to make those differences. Good. Thank you. Carrie? I think we absolutely have to do more. Until um, every airport is carbon neutral, we're not there. And so, um, so I think that's a rational goal for folks, but it can't take you 20 or 30 years to get there. Thank you. And Todd, if we can hear you, you get the last word. All right. Well, um, you know, at Indy, we're, you know, we think we're a leader and we're, we're, you know, uh, trying to be innovative and push both sustainability and resiliency forward. Um, but I would agree with the rest of the panelists that we need to do more um, to, to uh, shift, shift the, uh, you know, your organization, shift your community, you know, the industry. So I would agree with that. Good. Well, thank you all. It's really been a great conversation. I wish we had more time uh, and I, I do appreciate it. All right, um, finished right on time. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you to uh, the panelists. Um, I'll just say some closing remarks here. All right, um, well, that's, that's a wrap on um, in for today's uh, airport infrastructure uh, summit, I'd like to again thank uh, EXP, Oracle, uh, Maternal IPS, Populous, and Translook for uh, their support of the event, as well as uh, the contributions uh, of all our uh, speakers and uh, the staff uh, that that helped um, pull this event together. I think it was a great event. Um, I will be uh, distributing the uh, presentations as well as the video uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, you should receive those uh, via email. Um, 
So uh, in the meantime, thank you very much uh, for attending um, this event and uh, we will uh, look forward to hosting you at a uh, future InfraDay event. With that, uh, I'll say goodbye and um, we'll see you at the, uh, at the next event. Thank you.